Hello, welcome. Let's spend some time with Mildred Pierce by James M. Cain. This book was originally published back in 1941, and I read this vintage paperback edition that I picked up in a used bookstore a while back, and when I spotted this in the store, it really called my name. It's a hard-boiled suspense novel from the 1940s, so something I knew I was going to enjoy. Also, there was a very famous film that was based on this book, also called Mildred Pierce, and starred Joan Crawford. Uh, it was released back in 1945, and Joan Crawford grabbed herself an Oscar win for Best Actress for her portrayal of Mildred Pierce. And that film was eventually also put on the, I read up on it, um, the Library of Congress's National Film Registry, which uh, includes films that are deemed to be culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. And so the film has got a real noir feel, as does this novel, but they are really quite different. This novel was too hot for Hollywood, so the plot in the, uh, the film is quite a bit different than actually in the book. On this chat, I'm only going to talk about the book, so I'm only going to talk about uh, the novel. I am not going to talk about the plot, though, because this is a hard-boiled suspense novel, and so the plot is really everything, as are the characters. So I'm actually also not going to go into too many of the characters, really only the main characters that appear right at the very beginning of the novel and then continue out throughout um, most of the story, if not all of the story. So, yeah, I'm going to be careful to not give away anything that would detract from a first-time reader's uh, a reader of this novel. Even if you've seen the film, the novel is different, as I mentioned. So, yeah, so the main character is none other than Mildred Pierce herself. She, as the novel opens, is married to Bert, her husband. She has two daughters, one named Vida and one named Ray. Um, and so Vida... Uh, and, and Mildred wind up really basically being this, the main characters throughout the entire novel, and I will go more into that here in a bit. She also has a best friend slash neighbor named Mrs. Gessler, who also uh, figures very prominently throughout the novel. So those are really the main characters that we start off with in this novel. Um, there are others that we are introduced to that I don't want to give away because it's part of the suspense of the novel. Um, but it's, this novel takes place in Los Angeles. Of It starts around 1931, I think, if I remember right. It's still during Prohibition. So it covers this period of time from about 1931 through about 10 years. About till the time, about to 1941. And... So it's the Depression, and it's also Prohibition. So um, what has happened is Mildred Pierce's husband, Bert, so it's in Glendale. So Glendale um, at the time was a growing, you know, component of what we now know as, you know, greater Los Angeles. So Glendale was at this point uh, just sort of being developed and her husband, Bert, inherited some land there and started a real estate company, a development company for housing. And they live in this development company. Well, I mean, in this development. Well, um, so then what happens, of course, the depression comes along and the company actually gets into financial trouble and they lose the company. They actually, um, uh, are struggling a lot at this point, you know, financially, the, the house they're living in is mortgaged to the hilt. Um, Bert can't seem to quite get his footing in this new environment that he, that you know, they find themselves in with the Depression. Um, and so Mildred, ultimately, you know, she decides to take matters into her own hands. And, um, and, and she kicks Bert out, basically, because she's not so frustrated. I think she could, she could like, handle the fact that they don't have a lot of money and they're struggling because everybody is because it's the Depression. Her issue mostly is that Bert doesn't seem to care. He has, you know, I think that uh, this circumstances, uh, this, uh, he, he got his position and his um, company through circumstances. He inherited this um, 
this land. And then by the same token, when the de depression came along, that circumstance came along and ruined him. You know, he's sort of this person who just sort of um, exists by circumstance, whatever's going on, you know, like things happen to him. He doesn't make things happen for him. Mildred decides she's going to make some things happen for herself, and she kicks him out. Well, you know, she's, a, a at this point, a mother with two daughters. Uh, she does stay in the house. Uh, Bert goes to live with, uh, he was actually having an affair with someone, and he goes to live with that woman, sort of uh, on the side. But, um, you know, Mildred stays in the house, but she doesn't have any plan about what she's going to do. So it's not like she had a plan. Um, so she basically has no money. She has no skills because she's been a housewife. Um, well, you know, of course, that's skills to some degree, which she will eventually use to her advantage. But at the beginning, when she goes to employment agencies, they see her as a person without skills. Well, the other thing going on with the, with this whole family, really, well, mainly with Mildred and with Vita, her daughter, is their loss of position. So when the Depression had, so they had a sort of middle class, really stable upper middle class, I guess, position in society when they were, when her husband was successful. But with the Depression, they have, uh, they're in danger of losing that. But she wants to maintain that at all costs. So she's real picky about what job she's going to be able to take you know she doesn't want to take any kind of job that she would consider to be menial also her daughter Vita is very pretentious um and very snobby and sort of like a maybe like you know a wealthy upper middle class person would be uh, who thinks they're sort of entitled to you know uh, a certain position and a certain deference by everyone else they're better than everybody else kind of around them um even though they have basically no money at this point but this is sort of vita as well and so mildred always has in the back of her mind because she wants to um she wants to please vita and so she always has in the back of her mind like I can't take this job. You know, what would Vita think, you know? Um, so that's an issue when it comes to finding something that she can do to earn money. Um, yeah, so circumstances. So I talked about that a lot as far already about like circumstances with Bert, her husband, and with Mildred. Actually, this I think plays out throughout the novel in that the women in the novel do not really accept fate or accept circumstances. They go out and actually try to change their circumstances. They have a very, very much of a struggle to do that, but they try. And the men in the novel are the opposite. They uh, sort of take advantage of circumstance or um, are victims of circumstance. So there's a really, there's really a gender difference in, in the novel and how men and women sort of are relating to the world around them. And the women in this novel are very strong and very um, sort of directed as far as taking control of their lives or trying to take control of their lives. Um, yeah, so there's a quote that I want to talk that I wanted to mention here. Um, I always like to read, if I can, a, a, a brief bit about a book, you know, from a book, just because it gives an idea of what the writing's like and 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 sort of what the, the writing style is like. In this case, we're talking about a hard-boiled suspense novel from the '40s, so it's got a certain um, you know, it's got a certain, I think, um, vibe to it. It's got a certain sort of rhythm to it and, you know, the language that's used and this type of thing. Although it's not what you would call like, um, it's not a crime novel. Uh, so it's not like that hard boiled, but it's hard boiled in the sense of the characters here are really gripping, uh, trying to, to get a grip on really the hard realities of life and um, circumstance like I've talked about. All right, so what the, the section I thought I would read here is at the very beginning of the novel, so, to, so as to not give anything away, this is after Mildred has become uh, separated from Bert and a man has asked her out. Um, I didn't mention about too much about Mrs. Gessler, I don't think yet. Mrs. Gessler is Mildred's neighbor whose husband is involved in um, the the sort of the illicit, illicit alcohol trade. Um, and so Mrs. Gessler is very worldly and she's very knowledgeable about sort of the 
um, I guess the more rougher aspects of everyday life and trying to make it in the depression. Um, so Mrs. Gessler is about, about to have a party. And so this man has asked, uh, asked Mildred to go out for dinner. And so Mrs. Gessler, um, and Mildred's thinking, well, maybe I could bring him over to your party. And Mrs. Mrs. Gessler says, I wouldn't bring him over if I were you. Well, as you like, says Mildred. Oh, it's not that. He's welcome as far as that goes. But, you know, these are business friends of Ike's, Mrs. Gessler's husband, with their lady friends. All right, guys, trying to make a living same as anybody else, but a little rough and a little noisy. Maybe they spend too much time on the sea playing around in their speedboats. They're bringing in alcohol from Mexico and other places. And the girls are the squealing type. None of them are what you ought to be identified with, especially when you're a single young when you've got a single young man on your hands that's already a little suspicious of your morals. Mildred is a divorced or soon to be divorced woman in you know the early forties, so it's got a certain uh, you know uh, assumption that men might make about her. Um, and then so uh, Mildred says, "Do you think I'm taking Wally seriously? Well, you ought to be if you're not." Well, if not, why not? He's a fine, upstanding, decent young man that looks a little like a pot-bellied rat, but he's single, and he's working, and that's enough. <laughs> um, and then it skips down a little bit. Um, so Mrs. Gessler's trying to convince Mildred to not go to dinner with him, but to actually keep him there at her house and make him something for dinner. Um, and so Mildred's like, but he wants to take me out. Why would I go to the trouble to make dinner if he wants to give me a free dinner? And uh, Mrs. Gessler says, not so fast, baby. Let us pause and examine that idea. Why would he want to take you out? Why do they ever want to take us out? As a compliment to us, they say. To show us a good time. To prove the high regard they have for us. They're a pack of goddamn liars. In addition to being dirty bastards and very dumb clucks, they are also goddamn liars. They're practically, there's practically nothing that can be said in favor of them, except they're the only ones we've got. They take us out for one reason and one reason only, so they can get a drink. Secondarily, so we can get a drink uh, and succumb to their failed designs after we get home, but mainly so they can have, their, can have a drink. So Mrs. Gessler is saying, you know, men are basically out for themselves, and so women need to do the same thing. And Mildred actually takes this advice and runs with it. So let's talk about Vita for a minute. Vita is probably the worst daughter in literary history. She's a she's a she's something else. So this novel mainly revolves around Mildred and Vita, and their Vita's climbed from the middle class into social status. They live in Glendale. Vita likes the life of Pasadena. This is just sort of different sort of um, stratas of society in Vita's mind. And Vita does what she can to make sure she gets into that Pasadena society. And Mildred does what she can to try to make that happen as well. Of course, this all has very dramatic and tragic consequences eventually. Um, but Vita is quite a character. And Vita alone is worth either watching the film or definitely worth it to read this book. Here is a picture of Vita at the back that they've shown her here in the back. Um, but Vita is, is the quintessential spoiled um, daughter who is really out for herself from the get-go. Vita is named for an astronomical symbol, I think, or something. She got a name from an astrologer, and it's fate. She is just um, a very... Um, very strong-willed uh, young woman who really is taking those circumstances that I mentioned that she sees all around her and using them to the best she can for her own benefit, usually with very selfish and destructive results. So, and, and often successful. I think I will leave the chat at that. Uh, Mildred Pierce was a great, fun read. It is not going to be the last of the James M. Cain novels that I read. He also wrote other sort of hard-boiled noir classics like Double Indemnity and The Postman Always Rings Twice. So I'll be reading more of James Cain coming up. My next book chat is going to be Less by Andrew Sean Greer, and I should have a chat 
on this coming up fairly soon. So until next time, take care. Bye.